Linda, thank you very much. Um, I welcome everyone here. I know the room seems a little bit spread out, but I hope everyone's comfortable where they're sitting. It's such a pleasure to have the people on the faculty uh, be here. We have a wonderful faculty all three days for this meeting for the Venus sessions. And um, the talks are substantive, and we have time and space for questions for you to learn from the faculty. And that's the whole purpose of this meeting, is to make it useful to you in your practice. And um, we have some very interesting speeches this morning, and we're going to be starting out with Dr. Hunter, who's coming up here. Dr. Hunter uh, was a professor of mine at the University of Minnesota. He's been there his entire career. He's a professor, almost emeritus, <laughs> not quite. Yeah, yeah you are, <laughs> did you? And uh, he uh, worked with Kurt Amplatz and Willie Castaneda for many years and uh, just incidentally tutored me in physics so I could actually be here today. If it hadn't been for that help, I might not be standing here. But he is definitely um, my, one of my mentors and one of my favorite speakers, so I welcome him to the podium. He's going to discuss today or share with us his own experience. He's a marvelous interventional radiologist, and now he has his own uh, personal experience with deep vein thrombosis. Welcome. <laughs> so I'm, uh, uh, as Patty said, Dave Hunter. I'm an interventional radiologist at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I'm going to be talking about a topic that is kind of uh, near and dear to my heart, and that is the concept of treating patients who have DVT and spreading out our understanding and our concepts to include the patient instead of the pipe. Uh, in, uh, is this uh, forward, backward, or forward? There we go. <coughs> In uh, 1997, a, a group of young professionals uh, with the 3M company in St. Paul uh, decided uh, that they would like to learn rock climbing. And we have a few interesting places around Minneapolis and St. Paul and the surrounding areas where people can do this. And uh, so they got together with some people who were known high quality rock climbers and they all went up to uh, an area uh, called Taylor's Falls in Minnesota which is uh, where some of the better cliffs for rock climbing are located. And uh, one of the uh, men in the group, a 32 year old who was sort of the leader for this particular outing and then the teacher, belayed himself down to a place halfway down the cliff where there was a nice uh, platform, and uh, throughout the day, uh, he stayed on that platform and uh, helped people learn how to both go up and down. And uh, he spent a lot of time kind of uh, sort of crouching down, holding on to ropes and things like that, and supporting people as they would go up and down. And uh, towards the end of the day, uh, he got the last person up and uh, he was uh, squatting down, taking care of the ropes and getting ready to go back up himself. And uh, according to an observer from across the river, he stood up, stood still for about three seconds and then just fell backwards without any kind of resistance or scrambling off the cliff the rest of the way to the bottom. He was uh, airlifted to a uh, nearby hospital And uh, about three hours later, uh, his parents uh, allowed him to be declared uh, dead because he'd been uh, so severely brain damaged. About uh, two, or two or three years later, I came down on a flight to Chicago and uh, when I got here to the conference, I have ankylosing spondylitis and my foot was swollen. I thought, damn, it's that plantar fasciitis again. Got some ice packs and applied them to my foot. Uh, and by the time I got back to the University of Minnesota where I was gonna schedule to do some cases the next day, my foot was so painful I couldn't put my shoe on it. 
And I really couldn't stand and do my cases. And at the time, I was one of very few people there. And so I, I was examining my foot. And I thought, you know, this foot's been swollen before. It's never hurt this bad. I've had plantar fasciitis with swelling when I'd traveled in the past, always my right foot. And I felt that one of the veins on the dorsum of my foot where the, my pain was seemed like it was hard. So I got the ultrasound out and looked at it, and sure enough, it was completely thrombosed. And I thought, man, that's odd as hell. And uh, the, uh, the, I sort of got my soft shoe on and made it through the day, and at the end of the day, that foot was just hurting so badly that I just you know, knew I wouldn't be able to work the next day. So I got one of my partners uh, to uh, start an IV in that vein on the dorsum of my foot uh, using ultrasound guidance. And I got one of the residents at the time, who's now one of our staff people at the University of Minnesota. And uh, he and I sat there for about five hours injecting little boluses of TPA into that vein on the dorsum of my foot. By the next day, that vein was open. I was feeling better. I went to see a hematologist. He said, well, let's get a complete ultrasound. And uh, there were some other veins clotted, the deep veins on the plantar aspect of my foot, part of my posterior tibial veins by my ankle. And he said, well, statistically, you know, if you just have veins in this area clotted but nothing else, uh, you don't really need to be on anticoagulation. And I said to him, Dale, I said, you know, that's crazy. I said, you know, I'm not going to wait for this to go up my leg. I know at least I need to be on some kind of uh, heparin for a while, and I started on sub-Q heparin. Took it for about four weeks, felt incredibly better, and uh, went off it at the time. That was the first of four episodes that I'd had, and about three months after that, uh, I had a, uh, a brother who developed a problem with uh, some spots in his vision of one eye, and he's a professional musician, and he couldn't read his scores. And uh, his ophthalmologist thought that he had kind of a funny pattern, looked like a few vessels in his retina that looked like they might have clots in them. So started him on a few days of anticoagulation. He got a little bit better. But over the next few years, he improved slowly but uh, surely uh, until he could eventually read scores again. Uh, but by that time, was seriously wondering whether or not he'd be a professional musician. And about two years after that, I have a brother who has uh, been the road race champion on bicycles in the state of Minnesota, who uh, with his daughters who are marathon runners went running down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and jogged back up, jumped in a car, drove to Phoenix, got in an airplane and came back to Minnesota. And when he got off the airplane, got short of breath and started coughing, went to an emergency room and had a pulmonary embolism. And at this point, I said, you know, something major is wrong with this family. And I had us all tested, including my mother and father. And my mother tested possible for Leiden factor five, and the rest of us were positive, except for one brother. And we realized that the 32-year-old brother who died six years earlier probably stood up dehydrated and having been crouched down for a long time and had a pulmonary embolism and fell backwards off that cliff. When we think about DVT, we think about people who have veins that have clots in them instead about people whose lives can be incredibly impacted by something that can cause them to have pain, disability, or die. We've had one other person in our family, the, uh, my brother who had the pulmonary embolism, his daughter had a pulmonary embolism a few years later before they'd been tested. Unbeknownst to her, she was also positive. When you have patients with DVT, it's incredible what they can tell you if you listen to them. If you try to understand what their illness means to them and what their fears are, to understand what they need in order to get their life back together again, and talk to them about what treatments are really available, what medications are available, what the long-term care needs to be, 
you will find yourself being a much better doctor. The doctor who originally treated me, the hematologist, who said you don't really need anticoagulation, himself associated with a new malignancy just about 10, eight years ago, suffered a DVT of his upper extremities that left him almost incapacitated until we did thrombolytics on him, opened it up, and then he did anticoagulation long term. And eight months ago, when I had my fourth DVT, all of a sudden I had a different hematologist taking care of me, someone who understood the problems and said, you know, you need lifetime, lifelong anticoagulation. You need compression stockings. You need to take the kind of care of yourself I should have given you 15 years ago when I didn't understand what this can mean to people and what it can involve. The things that we have to do as practitioners is we have to be smarter. We have to understand the disease and its risks. We have to understand exactly what the drugs are. Those of us who have treated people with this realize that the complexity of the medications that we use, the platelet inhibitors, the thrombolytic drugs, the anticoagulants, the complexity of these drugs and exactly what they do physiologically for people and for clot problems is only vaguely at best understood. And many of us probably don't have an algorithm that allows us to treat people with dosages that are gonna be safe and with, with mechanisms that are gonna be safe and we don't refer people often enough for things like lymphedema treatment. As the director of the lymphedema clinic for approximately 15 years at the University of Minnesota, I know how many people have been very poorly treated who have chronic swelling problems whose swelling could be ameliorated by very simple and basic techniques that I offered them in that clinic. Lymphedema treatment should be the cornerstone of treating anybody who's had chronic venous problems, and it needs to be something that is mandatorily recognized as important by everybody. CMS and Medicare are just freaking idiots. They will not pay for compression stockings. I just had my first pair of compression stockings now that I am Medicare eligible, refused by Medicare for payment, as my patients have had all their lives. And because some of them can't afford to pay for them, which I can, they have gone without them. They have an inadequate compression, and some of them have therefore developed severe secondary complications that Medicare is more than happy to pay for at ten to $30,000 worth of payment of medical, medical health care bills. In each patient, we have to absolutely make sure that we treat the patient as a complete patient and not as a statistic. My hematologist was treating me as a statistic, not needing anticoagulation when he first saw me until he began to realize that people who have flow disturbances and a hypercoagulability disorder will never be normal and cannot be treated as statistics basing their, their decisions to treat you for three to six months instead of with a lifelong amount of anticoagulation. And have you ever thought of doing selective lysis? Selective lysis in one vein in my foot allowed me to return to work the next day. Didn't take a lot of effort, clearly not dangerous. Total dose five milligrams of TPA, or its equivalent in urokinase at the time and I was back at work the next day. There are ways that we can treat this disease if we individualize our care that I think makes it a very treatable problem in some cases where we are not doing that. The other thing we have to really realize is that speed is of the essence. This is just completely ignored. Vein disease is like any other disease. There are acute problems that can never be fixed and one of them is vein valves. If we don't get to them early, they'll never work. And so even though we can get the pipe open, there are going to be problems with venous hypertension if it's more than three weeks down the road. This is something that we have to be conscious of. Vein disease, I think, if people begin to treat it rationally and appropriately, will be treated as fast as bad arterial disease, as fast as heart attacks, as fast as strokes. We will get there and we will do what we need to do in a timely fashion so the veins stay normal. The other thing that I think we have to be conscious of is the fact that veins are not pipes. They are part of a complex network like a tree. 
My brother who had the DVT and the pulmonary embolus had problems with his bicycling and he, he is a road race champion in the state of Minnesota and was the over 50 year old road race champion and suddenly was having problems again with power in that leg of his. And when I looked at him, because they said, well, you have maybe a touch more DVT, but you've got one area of chronic obstruction that has inch and a half collaterals around it because you're such a powerful biker, so you really shouldn't have an issue. And I took him aside and did an ultrasound of my own and realized that every one of his veins coming out of his gastrocnemius and soleus muscles was packed full of clot. Without the tree being open, the pipe is useless. And therefore, I applied one of Patty Thorpe's techniques that she has done for many years to him, started an IV in his foot, drove that lytic for three days deeply into the veins of his calf as I possibly could. And at the end of three days, and just about a week ago when he was having questions of pain again in his calf that were not DVT, I re-looked at his sural veins with ultrasound and they're wide open about four or five years later. Without the branches of the tree, he wouldn't be a bicyclist today. And that's one of his things that he does as one of the greatest joys of his life. And you deprive people of that when you don't think of it as a tree instead of a pipe. We have all sorts of things that we've looked at as the years have gone by, and even simple things like using different drugs that may be more effective if we're treating DVT with thrombolytics have been ignored. They've been wonderful in the lab and they've never come into reality or practice for reasons that, to me that are you know, almost unacceptable. The power of ultrasound to, do, to assist in thrombolytics is just barely catching on in places where it should be almost mandatory for speed or if we could apply ultrasound to the whole leg as we talked about in the future of treating DVT so that every branch of that tree had its, had its clots lysed effectively instead of just the pipes. We would have treatments that would actually mean things to people's lives. And last but not least, whenever we treat a patient with DVT, we have to depend on our capabilities to realize that these are people that we need to treat like our relatives. We have to have the empathy, the kindness, and the caring to actually give to them the care that I give to my brother when he gets DVT. And that's the way I try and treat all my patients every time that I see them. And part of that is because we have to realize that medicine, as much as we understand and know, and as much as we rely upon statistics and studies to make ourselves practitioners that practice with scientific acumen, medicine is still as much art as it is science. And like great art, like you have before you, by my favorite artist, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, is always better than bad art. Thank you. David, thank you so much for the inspiration and for your clarity of thought. It's, it's wonderful to have you open our session, and I'm, I'm grateful for your sharing of that. Now the next person is going to be invited to the podium is a person who is a patient of mine. I can't say former patient because when I treat DVT, the patient is my patient for life. As long as I'm here, I'm available to them. And he lives here in Chicago, so I've invited him to come to the podium and share with us some of the things about having been a patient treated with urokinase, for a number of days and uh, having many stents in place for almost 15 years now. And uh, it's not a perfect solution, as, as he will tell you. And Phil, you can make your way up here, please. And this is Mr. Phil Kamak from uh, the Chicago area, who was, in fact, a professional golf instructor. And uh, I always remember and love to tell the story that he I said, when did you first get your DVT? And he says, well, it was the day after I played golf with Michael Jordan. And that always like strikes everyone as like, wow. But it took him seven years to be referred to Creighton University by Dr. Peter Glavitsky at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, 
And so I've known Phil and worked with Phil since 1998, and I've asked him to come here today and talk to you uh, about his experience with deep vein thrombosis. Phil, thank you. How do I change slides? Okay, we put his slides up, please. How do I change them? Oh, how do you change them? You go um, forward. Okay. Next. Thank you. And there's a pointer there, too. Ah, it's blank. Here, you, have, you look down here. Oh, there it is. Oh, terrific. Hi. Uh, that was very inspiring, Dr. Hunter, because that's something I've kind of campaigned on for years after my treatment was is that why aren't people that have DVT in their legs and having the clots dissolved immediately as opposed to the low uh, molecular weight heparin uh, treatment that has been done for 60 or 70 years and there hasn't been any change out of it. And even my uh, primary care physician, if one of his patients comes in with a DVT, he still does the same old treatment. So nothing new has been done as far as that goes. Well, this is my uh, first slide, and I'm going to try to pack 23 years into 15 minutes. And I'm not sure that's going to be possible. But I like to show this slide because that's where I got in Michael Jordan's head, was on the seventh hole at the Knollwood Club. We have golfers here? Couple, okay. Um, well, a little different from what Dr. Thorpe remembers, it was five days after that that I couldn't walk. And I was admitted to Lake Forest Hospital, and um, I, had to, I was put on low molecular weight heparin for a couple days. They did the ultrasound on Monday and found no blood clot. Sent me back home, the next week I went to work, and a couple days after that I couldn't walk. My right thigh in circumference was six inches bigger than my left. And they found a blood clot by doing a venogram. Um, and then I was admitted, and all the standard treatments were done, so on and so forth. And I'll just get into the progression a little bit as uh, we go on here. I was, I was diagnosed with acute deep, deep vein thrombosis, um, low molecular weight heparin, and anticoagulation was the, the treatment for a year. Now, at that time, I, my weight was around 190 or so, and I was uh, put on five milligrams of Coumadin and to be taken daily. A month after that, I developed a bruise on my right leg, and my INR was 35. So I was back in the hospital, and then they did the full gambit on me and decided that I did not have an inferior vena cava. And what I asked my doctor was very simple is, let's put one in. And you just heard that it's I just heard that it's not a pipe, but to me it's a pipe. Look, put, put, put one in, put in a piece of plastic, I don't care, let's get one, because this is a problem. So over the years I started to develop uh, venous stasis ulcers on my ankles. Um, that started the following year in 1991, 1992. It started to happen on both legs, uh, the right and the left. And that's kind of how um, my legs looked back in 1994 or so. 1994 was a bad year because that's when I started to have spontaneous bleeding. Working at a golf course, you're on your feet quite a bit. So I had thought one of the golf cars, transmission fluid had leaked all over my shoe. So I took my shoe off to clean off my foot and there was an eight foot plume of blood spurting out of my right ankle at that time. So that was a problem. Well, I was treated with Una boots and I started to go from physician to physician to physician. Being at a country club, they all know all the best doctors. Well, finally, the best doctor that I found was from my lawyer. And that sounds a little bit funny, but they know who's not getting sued, and they also know who they use for witnesses. And that brought me to the University of Illinois in Chicago and to Dr. Glavitsky, and then finally out to Dr. Thorpe in Creighton. A little bit about the treatment. Uh, Dr. Thorpe's treatment was, you know, using catheter-directed thrombolysis. They pumped, uh, she pumped 20 million units of urokinase through me. I have 17 stents in my abdomen, um, down through the iliacs into the femoral veins, and I'm on uh, anticoagulation therapy now, and I, my INR is between two and a half and three, and I tested Monday, I'm at three and a half. Just some pictures of that which uh, may be interesting for you people. Uh, this was done in 2007, I think. 
because I had uh, uh, blood in my urine. And uh, my doctor wanted to get uh, a picture all the way on through. So that's just kind of how that came out. And I just put it up here for everybody. That's what my right ankle looks like. And that was from 1998. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about after the treatment from 1998. That happened in December. Um, in January, I went skiing. In February, I started playing hockey. In the year 2000, I started playing hockey two to three times a week. And I was really trying to build up my legs. And it was easier for me to skate than really do anything else. And then my golf game came around. And in 2004, um, about a quarter of my rounds were at par or under. So I was doing OK. In 2003, I played Pebble Beach, Cypress Point, San Francisco Golf Club, and the Olympic Club four days in a row, and I walked all four days. Um, in late 2004, this is what happens when a automobile, a four-wheeled vehicle, is uh, traveling at someone on a two-wheeled vehicle. The two-wheeled vehicle person gets out of the way, and I kind of fell and had a contusion on my right leg. And the diagnosis was is that I had a uh, compartmentalized hemorrhage, which formed a blood clot in the lower part of my right leg. Just, uh, just another picture of that. And if you look at my left leg, that's kind of how my foot looks. It's nice and blue. Uh, this picture is actually from this spring. Uh, this is what happens when I slip and fall on my driveway. So, and at that time, my INR was about three, just a, the world's biggest hip bruise, I call it. Okay, so I like to say, what if? And Dr. Hunter hit on some of this stuff. What if thrombolytic therapy was performed on me the first time I was diagnosed, way back in 1990? Would I still have valve function? In, maybe not in one lug, but maybe in both? Or if not in both legs, maybe in one? Would I have the leg ulcers on both legs? The hyperpigmentation and the varicosities, would I need compression therapy? All that, so on and so forth, would be my questions. And as far as I know, and I may be wrong, uh, thrombolytic agents are not really approved for PVD. As far as I know, that's still an off-label type procedure. Some of those things need to get changed. And that, would, that brings me to the Affordable Care Act. What are the odds that I would be here if Obamacare was in place in 1998? I'm not sure. Are you doctors and you innovators going to be encouraged to use pharmaceuticals for off-label usage to develop new procedures? I'm not sure about that either. I, I have a standing golf lesson with my physician for my foot, my podiatrist, every Thursday. I'll be out with him tomorrow. And he has told me that he, already three of his friends are giving up their practices. That's, that's not good health care. My doctors that have seen me from 1998 on have said, I have had the best medical care in the world. There's nothing wrong with health care in America. There's a problem with health insurance and how to get it. OK, these people person. The other one's uh, a little bit harder, the one on the right. But they really drive me. I mean, my bride drives me to get up and walk with her on Sunday mornings. And it's a four-mile walk. And about halfway through it, I'm kind of done now. But I, she pushes me all the way through. The one on the right makes sure I don't get sedentary, because I don't feel like getting up and doing anything sometimes. That's the look she gives me when she needs something whether it's a walk, water, food, play with me. And she's, uh, she's three and a half years old right now and uh, really makes sure that I go on that half mile walk with her three times a day. So just a little bit where I'm at today, I don't work full time anymore. The last year that I worked full time was in 2008. Um, for those that know golf, I led the Golf Galaxy in instruction in 2007 and 2008. I've uh, been on disability since, and 
looking for something new to happen. So we're going to move to Utah and have fun, take the dog out there, hopefully retire. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. No, thank you. Stay right here. I want to ask you a question. Uh oh. Thanks, Phil, for sharing all that. Um, Phil actually talked to the people at Abbott Laboratories uh, in the early 2000s to share his experience and, and brought them to tears because one of the things he said was that after he got his leg fixed, he was able to shoot baskets with his son because before that, his, he, he was very disabled. And um, I want to, to have him stay here and just elaborate just for a minute on something that he did and which, which I hope... We didn't continue, but he established, he was so frustrated that physicians didn't understand DVT and his situation. And basically, I don't think he was born without a cava. It was thrombosed at some point in his life because I found the cava with lytic therapy and we re reconstructed it. So he, it, the cava was there. But he went to so many physicians who didn't get it, didn't understand and he started the American Vascular Foundation. As an individual, he went to the state of Illinois, established this uh, foundation as a nonprofit organization. We had little pins made up. He tried very much to get industry to support him in this effort to you know, donate money. Our whole idea originally was that we would get money in a foundation that would grow, and we could actually sometimes help buy compression stockings for people who couldn't afford to buy them, things like that. And I'd like you to just comment on having done that and what happened to, to that, because I think that's part of the story of DVT. Just a, just a minute or so. Okay. okay. Well, well, we ran out of money. That is really kind of what happened, and I did get frustrated because I couldn't find anyone to listen to me. And you know, it was interesting. I just talked to the Boston Scientific people out there and talked about Venus wall stents and how I should be their poster boy. And you know, they said, "Well, gee, this is real interesting." But I did that way back in one of the ones that you had in Oak Brook. I never heard from anybody again, and it's just really frustrating that you can't get anything going like that. And my goals were a little different than. Uh, what Dr. Thorpe wanted to do is, as opposed to just only educating, I wanted to get enough money to build a hospital and a research center. And that would have been taken like $100 million back then, but just never, ever happened. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to run it for as many years as I did um, without the support of the members of the club at Knollwood, because they know what I had been through. Oh, there's something else I wanted to say. If, if you want to know what I'm doing now, I get, I wear Venusan compression stockings. I get them twice a year. My bride buys them for my birthday and uh, for Christmas. So I wear them 26 weeks. She buys me seven pair at a time. I have on, these are, um, help me, circates, which I wear whenever I teach. When I teach now, I never teach two consecutive days anymore. It's just a little bit too hard. By the end of the day, I'm wiped out. So when I go home today, I, I will spend most of my time on my back. I lay with the dog uh, until she looks at me with that look again. So, okay? It, if anyone has questions, I'm going to kind of be your uh, exhibit A. So she's kicking me out of here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil. I really appreciate you sharing all that with us. And I have told Phil, too, that it sounds like he needs to be looked at for maybe some restenosis, because after 15 years, there can be some intimal hyperplasia where the stents overlap, and we can correct that with uh, uh, balloons and uh, some new stent devices we have. Anyway, it gives me great pleasure to uh, have had you share that with us. And now Dr. Romy Chopra, who is an interventional radiologist at the Midwest Vascular Institute for Minimally Invasive Therapy, and a longtime friend, is also going to give us a talk about chronic venous insufficiency. Great, thank, you. All right, thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, there were two emotional stories. You know, you can tell from my headgear, I grew up in the East, and uh, it's very interesting. Many years ago, you, know, you work very hard to become a physician and you use the logic of the West. I see a lot of friends here who had personal stories now. And when you're in India, growing up in that culture, you're taught to be a healer, not a doctor. 
So how many of you think, you don't have to answer this question, but in your mind, think of yourself as healers? Because if I tell somebody I'm a healer, they think I'm a quack. And that is the problem I, this is just a little commentary before I start my talk, about getting too far to the logical side of things and forgetting some of the, the wisdom that's been around for thousands of years in different cultures, and that's what they, they teach. A comedy said, David said, you know, treat him like you treat your brother. And, and I've, for the last 15 years, made a conscious decision. I call my practice the mother practice. So if a vendor comes in and tries to sell something to me, I look him in the eye and say, would you put this in your mother? If there's even a nanosecond hesitation, I know that's not, that's not valid. So that's, a, that's where the empathy and those things come in. And one final thing, a comment, and then I'll go to the thing is, I learned a long time ago, again from Eastern culture, that you are not in this world. The world is in you, which is what David was saying. You're not a statistic, you're an individual, and practice needs to be individualized. And the future of medicine five years from now is all going to be individualized medicine, whether it's with molecular and genetics, et cetera. With that little commentary, I'm going to... Oh, okay. That gives me a few more minutes to uh, gab about other stuff. Um, how many of you treat uh, DVT cases like the ones you heard about, lysis or anything like that? Oh, yeah, we can do it. Um, on the little things they have there. Okay, sure. All right, but just since he was setting the talk up, I thought I'd ask. And how many of you treat superficial venous disease? A few hands here, okay, so. And uh, my first talk now is on how to evaluate edema. Yes, they brought it down. Excuse me. Sorry for the interruption here. Anybody have any questions at all? Okay. So uh, while they're putting up the slides, uh, I have 15 minutes to, to do this and stay on time. So it's how to evaluate a patient who comes in with edema in the ambulatory setting. Um, and obviously the uh, issue that comes in when you first see a patient walk into your office versus being admitted uh, in the hospital is do they have a localized disease to the limb or do they have something that's more generalized? And uh, when the slides come up, talk a little bit about, if you understand the pathophysiology, first the physiology and then the pathophysiology of how fluid moves around, what causes the fluid to move around, it becomes very easy to evaluate the patient. And uh, in, with edema, it is very, very common to have a misdiagnosis, so, because medications can cause that, local trauma can cause that, Congenital diseases called, cause edema, systemic diseases, heart disease, uh, the um, renal disease. So how do you, when you, especially if you have a vein practice, uh, I've been lucky now in the last uh, few years to have a very, very busy vein practice, uh, starting with superficial venous disease. And the problem is that most doctors and folks in the community believe that venous disease is not a real thing to treat. And the first message is that, one, it is not uncommon, whether it's DVT leading to chronic sequelae or just superficial venous insufficiency. And we got it. And what I'm also amazed about is how uh, little folks who treat this know about this. For example, most folks feel you just ablate the greater saphness and all superficial venous insufficiency is gone. So very few folks understand the hemodynamics, what's happening, et cetera. Can I turn on my slides, or is that? All right, no worries. So those are some of the important things to understand before going just through an algorithm, if you would. You know, here's the list of diseases, here's the conditions, et cetera. So I went to med school in India, and at that time, the commonest thing we saw was elephantiasis, filariasis. I threw up a slide for and you see some enormous legs with conditions that you would never believe. Um, and one of the, is that uh, looking up fine there? Uh, 
All right, no worries. I'll keep talking. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so coming back to it, first is find the common etiologies of when a patient walks in. What's the commonest thing that this patient probably could have? The second thing after that is, of the three things that cause edema, what possibly is this? Start by very good history. David talked about listen to the patient, and it's amazing. And now I've done this in my practice where the, the secretary at the front desk, the medical assistant, the PA, and myself, we follow the same algorithm. We ask the patient, what bothers you? Where is your problem? And we say, point with one finger, and it's amazing. When you follow that with an ultrasound or examination, you always find a problem. Because you know you live with the adage, you're not in the world, the world is in you. It's what they feel, what they perceive, and they sense their problem very, very quickly, so you focus from that. So now that I've got some slides and some structure to this, uh, we'll talk about how to examine and investigate a patient with low extremity edema. I have not yet met one individual, especially women, who do not want beautiful legs. Is there any woman in this room who does not want beautiful legs? No hands up. I did a sclerotherapy on an 85-year-old woman who had this big vein going down her leg. And uh, I, when I did that, she started crying. She was so happy. And it occurred to me that beauty implies implicitly and explicitly that it has to be underlying healthy. So focus on my, the reason I put this slide up was every patient we come up with, what's the problem? What's the goal of therapy? And the goal of therapy is first to resolve a venous ulcer or pain and swelling, and then finally to have healthy, good legs so that they can ambulate, do the things they want to do, whether it's biking, running, et cetera, and have normal physiology. So by definition, edema occurs when there's accumulation of fluid in the, I can't point with this, I guess, uh, when there's accumulation of fluid in the interstitial or the intracellular space. True, I just have to kind of probably be a little rough. That's okay, we're good. So ha when you look at this, you have the blood vessel, you have the interstitial space, and the intracellular space. And there are few factors that govern that. One is the hydrostatic pressure. So that's the pressure that's in your, in your system, in your, in your vascular system. If that goes up, now you know that there's going to be fluid being pushed in. So that would give you conditions when you have venous insufficiency, venous obstruction, et cetera. You'll see that the hydrostatic pressure goes up and that causes edema. Uh, if the oncotic pressure goes down, uh, that means whether that's renal, uh, when protein goes through or whatever else is happening, there's not enough protein to hold back the water. We'll talk about that in a second. That's the second thing that causes fluid. The third is where there's not enough lymphatic drainage. And which one of these three main things is causing the problem? And if you keep this, and I put this picture up a few times, so when you see a patient, this image needs to pop up in your head. And in that image you go, okay, pressure coming in, hydrostatic pressure, something pulling it back, oncotic pressure, or lymphatic drainage, and what's really working here or not. And it is the imbalance of one of these three things that will cause water, liquid, edema, to develop in the interstitial and in, in, um, intracellular spaces. We have a fixed volume of liquid, so overhydration is going to, if you have too much water and you're not peeing it out, you've got renal problems, you're going to have edema. Similarly, as we walk through, you'll see, normally there's a balance in the body between capillary pressure going forward, oncotic pressure pulling it back, whatever little bit escapes out of the capillaries is picked up by the lymphatics and goes out. So if you see somebody with unilateral edema, it's been around for a long time, the skin looks firm, they tell you it's been slow and gradual, you know there's something happening with lymphatics, and it's lymphedema. And then they tell you that they had some surgery, then you know it's probably something wrong with the lymphatics when they had surgery, as you see after breast cancer in the upper extremity, but you'll see things like that in the lower extremity as well. Uh, <coughs> So let's talk about these four little factors here, and then this helps you kind of evaluate the patient very effectively. So alteration in the hydrostatic gradient uh, where the venous hypertension now occurs. So if you have somebody with CHF, 
happen suddenly, bilaterally, jugular veins are distended, you know there's a cardiac cause. If there is uh, just one leg or asymmetric between the two legs, you're looking at venous insufficiency. Now, if you have uh, history of DVT, so history becomes extremely crucial. You got history of DVT, you got other signs going on, you know that this could be from a venous obstruction. On the other hand, you have somebody who has uh, recent proteinuria, there's bilateral edema, it's not asymmetric, you're probably looking at something like nephrotic syndrome, et cetera. That comes from the oncotic gradient. The proteins are going out of the bloodstream into the urine, and now the fluid cannot be retained back. Sepsis, you get edema, hypothyroidism, uh, mixed edema, angioedema. These happen when the capillary permeability is, is damaged, the vascular permeability. And finally, as we talked about, the lymphatic drainage, whether it's infection. Uh, now, you also look at some local causes, and in your community, what's the commonest? In our community, DVT, trauma, a ruptured Baker's cyst, a fracture, or something like that, venous insufficiency, lymphedema, cellulitis, obviously you have other signs and symptoms that go along with that. Now, in some part of the world, filarius is, and I'll show you a picture, which can be dramatic. The reason for that, though I show you a dramatic picture, is travel now is very easy. A lot of folks travel a lot, and I had a patient who's an executive traveling a lot to the east, and you have to keep some of these things in mind after you've ruled out the other things that they could have acquired something. So when you look at DVT, you know it's unilateral, it's started suddenly, there are other factors that come in. Venous insufficiency, you have chron it's a chronic condition, it doesn't happen overnight, you'll have all the other signs of venous insufficiency that come in. Lymphedema, again, could be primary or secondary, it's chronic, long time, they'll tell you it's been for years, they tolerate it for a while. Now, you might think that this limb cannot go back to normal. What you have to realize about lymphedema is, just like with DVT undertreated, lymphedema is an uncurable but treatable disease. I have had patients whose limbs have gone from literally elephant trunks almost all the way down to normal where they are functional, and that, that's an important thing to remember. Infection, cellulitis, of course, you have all the other uh, factors with it. Uh, Filarius is, as you can see, that, that limb, it's amazing. I got hundreds of pictures like this where it is just unbelievable uh, the size that it can get to. So what's the strategy, which is the key part? Patient walks in your office, what do you got to do? One thing, I, and I remember this struck me when I had a fellow who came in and his diagnosis was edema. And I said, that's not the diagnosis, that's a physical finding that there's edema. So edema is the physical finding you got to determine what's causing the edema underlying, and a history, physical examination, and kind of the investigative process of what's happening, applying the principles of why this fluid is shifting, will get you to the underlying cause. And it's amazing, there's some studies that have shown how in the ambulatory setting, especially with primary care, most patients don't show up in a specialist office, they go to a primary care doc's office, how often this is misdiagnosed because there are so many conditions that can cause this. So good history, and then a logical evaluation process will obviously get you to it. So this is a logic that I follow a little bit. Now, I've, when I see these patients, they're already screened a little bit. So you have peripheral edema. The first question you ask is, is this unilateral or bilateral? If it's unilateral, then you start looking at, you know, is this something to do with the venous system? Are they on Coumadin? If they had DVT, is there venous insufficiency? So now you're down that pathway. If not, then you look at it and say, you know, is this lymphedema? That's the other process that you have. If it's bilateral, then you look at the jugular vein and say, you know, is this some cardiac cause? If not, then you can go down some of the other conditions and basically follow an algorithm that takes you. Now, I'm not a cardiologist. I don't treat heart conditions, or I'm not a nephrologist, and I don't treat or primary care doc. I get them screened out, and I'm looking at lower limb. But it's not uncommon for me to have a patient misdiagnosed, sent to me as a venous problem when they got some other underlying problem going on. So this kind of algorithm has been helpful for me. Another two, a few very important factors that I keep in my algorithm is acute or chronic. The picture's changed. So if somebody walks in and say, I just developed edema yesterday and it's bilaterally, it's looking at CHF or something else. If they've had it for a long time, asymmetric lymphedema and, and some of those uh, conditions as well. 
if they've had history of trauma. I had a lady who was sent to me, they thought she had a venous problem and she had a ruptured Baker cyst. Another one was with a uh, fracture, a runner had a fracture, he just uh, it was lived through the pain, et cetera, had edema, and they thought it was uh, venous uh, problems, but actually it was just from the underlying fracture. And you want to start looking and say, okay, I got to exclude some of this. So again, to emphasize, edema is a physical finding. The only diagnostic test you can do to say whether you have edema or not is put your finger and press hard on it and see whether you have pitting or not. You can look at it with ultrasound, but that's not a diagnostic test for edema. So that's, that's an important thing to do. Then you want to do a comprehensive examination to go through the logical process of coming to an etiology of what that is. Now, it's common and uh, established practice to grade, and it's a subjective thing of 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, depending on how much the pitting edema is. And it's helpful if you're going to pro examine the patient progressively and see if they've uh, improved or not. So if somebody has 4 plus and you put them on diuretics and now it's 2 plus, you know they've had some improvement. Some folks talk about uh, doing ankle circumference and that's very, very good, especially if you're treating somebody with lymphedema. I have about 10 patients in my practice and uh, we've worked them through it. We don't do all the complicated studies but compression therapy and, and there's some therapy, physical therapists who specialize just in lymphedema and will do a fantastic job for them. And they fall in love with you because for 30 years or so, they've been told you can't walk. For women, it's a cosmetic issue as well. For them, just to get functional is huge. Some folks talk about the level of edema, how far, but that can change, so it's not very objective, but it's still worthwhile keeping that. And the most effective strategy is find the common things that you know you're dealing with in your patient population, Focus on those first, exclude that, then walk on to the next. But not to jump to an immediate conclusion, but to go through that logical process of evaluating it. And an important thing to remember is drugs. There are a lot of drugs which are common, antihypertensive, channel blockers, beta blockers, et cetera, uh, folks on steroids and other medicines that can get edema, and they don't get put through an extensive workup process. So it's important to ask, if there, there's a drug history going on. And then obviously, once you've got that there's edema, you work through all the different conditions that you're looking at. And it's extremely important or helpful, at least for me, to have that picture in my mind of saying, am I dealing with something that's caused increased pressure? Am I dealing with something that's, you know, oncotic gradient problems or pressure problems? Or is this something to do with uh, lymphatics and permeability? So in summary, Focus on the most common things. Uh, rule out the less common thing. Uh, I mean, uh, less common things down the line, but make sure that you've gone through the algorithm in your head. Uh, try to figure out the pathophysiology because treatment options are very effective if you have the right mechanism. So if you have somebody with a permeability issue and you put them on the right meds, it goes away fast. CHF, you put them on diuretics and find out what the cause is. Edema resolve fast. If it's chronic venous insufficiency, then you gotta put them on the right compression therapy, and that's a talk later this afternoon. And then go to diagnostic tests. One of the things I've seen very commonly is, yeah, edema, there's no thought process, they get a CT, ultrasound, something, and the patient's bounced around, misdiagnosed, going through a lot of stuff, and later on you find another problem. So with that, I'll end, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rami. Um, how many people have had a patient refer to them for what ends up being DVT and the patient's on Lasix? Because someone out in the other uh, hospital put them on Lasix thinking that would help their edema and actually it makes their DVT worse. So I, I think that's a, a, commonly, a common thing that I find and, and uh, it's something to uh, goes with your talk. Isn't it? Now that our next speaker is a great honor to have you come again this year. Thank you for being with us. He's widely sought around the world, I'm sure. Dr. Thomas Rook is the uh, Department of Vascular Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and has been for many years. I've referred patients to him over the years and I come to uh, greatly appreciate his knowledge. So thank you, Tom. He's going to talk about a variety of subjects this morning, first starting with venous screening.
Well, Patty, I want to say, first off, this has been just a remarkable session this morning. I, I, I go to Venus meetings all the time, and I've never quite, you know, walked up here at this point of the meeting feeling like I feel right now. Uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about here will, will uh, impact on some of the other things you've heard. Um, this is actually my second talk of the morning, if you, you know, I can give it first if, if you want, but... Uh, uh, I can go ahead and do this. This is um, uh, a little talk here about uh, looking at varicose veins and, uh, and what we think about here. What I'm going to do is something a little bit risky for you today. I'm going to discuss a novel idea. And anytime you discuss a novel idea, you wind up running the risk of uh, disaster occurring. This novel idea base is based around the idea of what causes varicose veins, something we've already heard quite a bit about today. And the, this is the conventional wisdom, folks. The conventional wisdom is we start out with normal veins, and then as a result of things like venous hypertension and genetic factors and various acquired factors, we wind up with these tortuous, ugly, useless things. And we think of this process as being some kind of a breakdown. It's akin to things rusting or things eroding or maybe just whatever that thing is that happens to your kid's sneakers, you know, they, but, but it's, a, it's a breakdown, destructive process. Well, where does the venous hypertension come from? We're bipeds. We're the only animals that walk up upright here. So you'll hear your patients say, you know, doc, I got my veins because I, I stand at my job too much. And there may be a little bit of truth to that. Uh, certainly the most dependent part of our legs are subjected to high pressures and over time, this probably contributes to this dilatation process that can ascend or sometimes descend. We know that there's genetic components to this, and all you have to do is open any of the journals out there. I picked this uh, little article by David Gillespie. This is the old, I got them from my mom hypothesis here about varicose veins. But we've found a whole bunch of um, various factors that, uh, uh, and uh, genes and uh, uh, innate things that will all contribute to the formation of these veins. And then we have the acquired factors. You know, this is the, oh gosh, you hear a million things. You know, I got them when I broke my leg. I got them when I was playing softball and I got hit by a softball. We know that there are acquired things like, for example, superficial phlebitis that can damage valves, damage the walls, and set a process into motion so that when the clot finally dissolves, you're left with superficial varicose veins. You don't have to have clot to do this, though. You can also have, as John Bergen used to like to point out, inflammation that's not associated with clot. He talked about this rolling leukocyte model, but inflammatory things that are acquired seem to be a factor here. And then there's stuff that I don't even know how to describe it. Is it genetic? Is it acquired? I mean, what do you do with stuff like hormonal influences? Uh, any woman knows that, uh, you know, probably ground zero for developing varicose veins is during pregnancy, but you also can get them at around the time of, of um, uh, puberty. You can get them in the perimenopausal period. We make a joke that every hot flash gives you a new spider vein, but it's not really a joke. It's a, it's a time when you develop a lot of these veins. And we know that uh, if you damage your liver, for example, uh, the, you know, people who drink too much, and, and raise their intrinsic estrogen levels will, will form as a side effect uh, telangiectatic new vessels. This has led to you know, jokes uh, you know, about red noses and varicosities as far back as you can recall, but it's a, um, it's a common th phenomenon. And then there's other phenomenon that again, I don't know if they're genetic or acquired. I've now taken care of two patients uh, with lymphomas that have developed extensive relatively unexplained diffuse telangiectasia. It's well reported in the literature. I don't know what this factor is that drives this, but something does. Well, the bottom line, though, is that this is a primary varicose vein. There's what it looks like on a venogram. This is what it looks like in real life on your leg. And if somebody asks you if you want them, you better check, no, thank you, because you don't want these things. They're bad for you. 
I mean, what about this? This is another venogram here. This is a CT venogram that's been recon, you know, reconstructed. But you have to admit that you know, this particular vein I'm showing you looks a lot like that other primary varicose vein I showed you. Except that this one ain't a primary varicose vein. It's a, it's a vein that has grown around an occluded vena cava, something we've already seen this morning. And this would be, a, 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 the man on your right there is a, more of a, a clinical representation of what this looks like. These are collateral varicosities or secondary varicosities. Do you want to have them? Well, you know what, maybe. Maybe if they are the only thing that's decompressing your lower extremities and keeping you from getting an ulcer, you might want to be good at forming these things if you lose your, your main vessels. Well, what are the mechanisms of these secondary varicose vein formations? We can learn about this by looking at what happens to vein grafts or actually studying secondary varicosities like this, this uh, second person up here has. And what we discover, to make a long story short, is that it's all the same factors we see elsewhere. The histology of these veins looks the exact same as with primary varicose veins. It has inflammation. They depend on hypertension to develop. Um, and they have the same reliance on things like uh, matrix metalloproteases, various growth factors. Estrogens promote the growth of collateral veins as well as they promote the growth of primary veins. In other words, these look the same. And the factors that make you good at making primary varicose veins are the same factors that make you good at making secondary varicose veins. And yet, we've, we've looked at these processes and we've had conventional wisdom that says, oh, these ones here on our left, they're bad. They're caused by degeneration. They're the same things that made the kids' tennis shoes fall apart. These ones on the right, though, they're growth and remodeling. They're a good thing. We want to have that. Well, this got me thinking, what if, the, what if the veins that we traditionally think of as primary varicose veins really aren't caused by degeneration? Why couldn't they also be specifically directed growth and remodeling? We just don't understand why it's happening. Well, if you're willing to think about that, then you have to ask yourself another question. If you're good at making varicose veins or you're good at making collateral veins, would you be good at making collateral arteries if you needed to? Uh, what do we know about collateral artery formation? Well, again, I'll just run through the literature in a second because it looks like it's all the same stuff. Collateral arteries depend on inflammatory changes, the same genetic factors like metalloproteases, the same growth factors, uh, estrogen. You find all of these same things that are associated with venous growth are also associated with arterial and arterial collateral growth. And it's, it's even more interesting because if you dive back into the literature, you'll find lots of cases where, um, where people have actually found clinical correlations between the two without necessarily putting it together. Here's a, a paper where somebody made the point that they looked at a bunch of patients with coronary ectasia and said, boy, Here's a funny coincidence. All these people also have big varicose veins. They assumed that, uh, that this was just a defect in the wall affecting both vessels. It may be, but, but again, it, it, gives, um, it gives pause to thought that there may be some common process leading to vein and artery remodeling. Um, now, this is important because I'll give you another jump of a little leap of faith here. If you're good at making varicose veins or you're good at making collateral veins, or you're good at making collateral arteries, how about that other thing we've been listening to about today? Could you be good at making new lymphatic vessels? Well, you know where this talk's going already here. If we jump into the literature and we look at what we know about how, how uh, lymphatic vessels are formed, it's the same factors. It's VGF, it's the FOXC2, or the forkhead box. And we can also find clinical correlations like lymphedema dystichiasis, which is a form of lymphedema caused not by lymphatic obstruction, but by overproduction of lymphatic vessels. And it turns out that you look in the literature, people have shown that um, people with this form of lymphedema all have impressive varicose veins. 
So again, there seems to be some common factor for all of this. It raises this final question. Could varicose veins actually be a good trait? If the ability to form varicose veins indeed correlates with an ability to form arterial or lymphatic collaterals, then think about it. People with varicose veins or people who are good at forming them might have less cardiovascular mortality or morbidity than people who can't. Why? Well, because they can form arteries like this when others can't. And the same would be true with lymphedema. Maybe people with varicose veins will have less lymphedema because when their lymphatics become blocked through surgery or radiation, they can grow new ones. Well, I, I've kind of looked into, um, into this, you know, if you interpret some of the old literature with a new eye, look at this normative aging study here. They, uh, they started with an observation that was curious, which I've also made, and that is that people with varicose veins seem to be less likely to have uh, femoral artery occlusive disease. They asked what happens if you look at their hearts, and people with varicose veins in this study have 36% less symptomatic coronary disease. And indeed, if you look at what happens to their mortality, they have a marked increase in survival. So people with varicose veins, at least based on this one large study, die less often and have less, they have better symptoms in survival. Could this be because they're better at forming arterial collaterals? Well, we can also ask the same thing about lymphedema here. All I did for this next series of slides was jumped on Google and pulled down the first five pictures that came up. And one thing you'll find when you look at people on the internet, which is true in your own practice, who have lymphedema, is that they almost never have varicose veins. These are some of the most pristine legs in the world. I know what you're saying. Well, these people are obese. The obesity, you know, the fat's going to hide the veins. That's not the case. Fat legs, you can see varicose veins on. People with lymphedema have less varicose veins than other people. And um, this has led to uh, some thinking that we've had that, you know, well, what happens uh, if you go down to our lymphedema clinic at Mayo and you look at the women who are sitting down there post-mastectomy, their legs all look pristine. Um, it's generally accepted that you know, somewhere around 30% of people who have mastectomy with or without radiation will develop lymphedema. In my, in my vein practice, I've seen 63 of my varicose vein patients over the years who've come through and had mastectomy. How many of them would I expect to develop upper extremity lymphedema as a result? Maybe 15 or 20? I've had one, and it was a quick transient case. But we're, I'm bringing you the message here that we're looking at this right now in our Olmstead County database, and we're going to be able to answer what the effect of varicose veins is on mortality, CV disease, etc. So here's my risky novel idea. Varicose veins isn't disease. I think that it's a, it's a genetic remodeling thing, and that people who have the ability to make varicose veins are also better at making venous and arterial and lymphatic vessels than people aren't, uh, who can't do this. So varicose veins is sort of the price you pay for being a good collateral former. And this is what my kids tell me is a, well, that's fantastic moment. I guess that's what this WTF stands for. But, you know, it's, it's just a novel and kind of new way of thinking about this that, that uh, I've certainly embraced. And I hope next time I can come back and talk to you, I will have my own data to discuss this. Thank you. And, and now you're going to get an extra big dose of me. You guys are going to be so full of me this morning by the time this is done because we've got a second talk here that's going to come on up in a second. The, um, I, uh, I would encourage all of you who deal with lymphedema patients if you go back and look at your own practice and you, you take what I've just told you in mind and look at, look at your patients with lymphedema, I think you'll all be struck by the, uh, by the dearth of varicose veins that you find in these patients. There's something about them that once you're tuned into it, you begin to realize, holy cow, my patients with 
lymphedema, particularly the congenital or the early onset types are the ones who've developed lymphedema as a result of sort of minimal, minimal um, yeah, I've injury. Had, I've had uh, a bunch of patients who quote unquote have a venal lymphatic syndrome where they don't have visible varicosities and like a whole bunch of them, but they've got venous reflux mm -hmm. and significant when treated that, it helped the swelling go down and got them back close to normal with uh, physical therapy on the lymphedema side. Yeah, and, and one of the early, you know, concerns that, you know, I, I dealt with with thinking about this was the fact that there are so many people with venous disease who develop lower extremity lymphedema and vice versa. Um, but you know what typically happens there, it's, it's a little unfair situation in the lower extremity because people who have venous disease develop chronic edema and, and that chronic edema, as we've seen already, sometimes uh, results in cellulitis, which destroys lymphatics, and you does, wind up with a combined does, does picture. Does your theory tie into destruction of the valves yeah. or just generation of telendectasia? Well, I don't know. I don't know, you know, if these valves are, are destroyed or whether they, you know, this is a, largely a remodeling process in primary venous disease. Well, here's the second topic here. We're going to talk about controversies and venous screening. Uh, there we go. We'll tighten that up here. This is um, a definition from, uh, from, the, from Medicare, and uh, it says that, I don't know, I think you're in a, you, you might want to re, reformat that in the, that's, <laughs> okay, that screening studies, though, this slide basically says it it's, it's the CV, uh, uh, CMS. Medicare. It's Medicare's um, um, explanation for what they think a screening study is, and it basically says that a screening study is one that you do when the patient has no signs or symptoms or evidence of the disease. If you have those things, it's not a screening study. Hmm. And, and why is that important? Well, it's important because, let's see, I can't, there's some more on this slide than this, but basically it, uh, it's important because it is something you're gonna to have to pay for as far as Medicare is concerned. It's not something that they're interested in covering. Now, just because screening studies um, may call for out-of-pocket things or because we've sometimes been able to push them through, there are certain areas where we've, we've gotten uh, screening studies to be sort of big business. Um, Colon screening is one of them. Whew. I'm gonna just give you guys a second there and maybe you can fix this because otherwise I'm gonna. Hmm. Uh, Tom? Yeah. I would like to just go back and ask the same question that Rami sort of asked is that, um, I can see the remodeling with the arterial disease. Mm -hmm. What about the fact that uh, a lot of the varicose veins are a result of valvular incompetence right at the saphenofemoral junction? Well, I, again, I think that becomes one of those acquired things. I don't know why we develop incompetence at the saphenofemoral junction. I, is, this, is this caused by injury? Is this, if this is a degenerative process, you know, it's... Um, it's not one that's clear to me why it occurs. All I can say is that right now when you see this going on, it seems to be associated with these, these other factors that can in the right setting be beneficial. Well, now we're back on track. See, there's lots of things that we screen for. We screen for colon cancers. We screen for prostate cancers. We screen for breast cancers. I recently assembled a... Um, uh, this group of uh, experts, you can see two out of three of them there. Uh, these are my boneheaded kids, and I asked them what we're supposed to screen for, and they told me cooties were the things that you needed to screen for. They're growing out of that right now. They've actually reached a, this. Wor this is a lot funnier when the slides actually work. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the um, you know the the fact that we have to. Screen pay for some of these things or that screening that's covered is very limited hasn't prevented it from being popular in real life here. I live in the most over-medicated city in the world, Rochester, Minnesota, and under my windshield wiper one day was this flyer 
inviting me to come to a hotel and get screened. And these were all the things that they were going to screen me for here, uh, including a screen for deep leg scan. And it says down here, using a light sensor, uh, they'll check for blood clots in the large veins. Left untreated, these clots can dislodge and travel to the lungs um, uh, or heart, resulting in death. This is a pretty serious thing. So for $60, they'll screen me for that to see if I have it. Uh, well, this kind of approach to screening has led to a number of controversies here uh, regarding it. And I like to approach controversies in vascular screening with uh, sort of three questions. The first is, should we screen? And we can rely on some of the things we know about arterial disease screening when we look at this here. Uh, should we screen for arterial disease? Well, I think it's appropriate to do so when you can detect it early, and we have all kinds of evidence, like from the AVA data, that shows that there's a lot of undetected disease out there in the public, so that, we, yeah, we can detect this kind of disease early in arteries. We should, we should screen when effective therapy is available, and for artery disease, we have all kinds of effective disease. That's not controversial. We should screen when early treatment leads to better outcomes. And um, that is a little controversial. For AAA, it looks like you know the government will actually cover some of that because they think it leads to, not for PAD. So this is an area where there's controversy. And I only bring this up just to, just to show you that we can answer some of these questions uh, by looking at our arterial side first. What do we screen for and how? Who do we screen? These are all controversial things. When you're screening arteries, do you use the ABI? What role does intimal thickness play? Brachial reactivity, CT calcification. Who do we screen? Do we screen the elderly? Do we screen the young? These are all highly controversial things. Now what I want to show you is that on the venous side, we can address screening with these exact same questions. Should we even be screening for venous disease? Well, the American Venus Forum thinks we ought to. They think it's important because this is common, it can be fatal, and uh, as we've heard, it can result in long-term disability. So if that's the case, then I would say, well, I've developed some criteria here for the arterial side. Do they apply to venous screening? I'm not so sure. This is me thinking about it, and I'm wearing my Venus Forum tie there, so I must be you know, in the groove on this, but the problem is, is that arterial disease is not the same as venous disease, and our goals are different. Our goals in venous disease really aren't to detect occult disease and intervene on them early. We don't want to look for things like DVT and PE. What we want to do is prevent them. So the rules change when we're looking at venous disease. We ought to screen when high risk can be detected early, when prevention is available, or when prevention leads to a better outcome. Are these things possible right now in venous disease? Well, can we detect high risk early? You know, the American Venus Forum has actually done a scientific screening program. They published some guidelines on it. This was all done in 2007. I played a role in that, that paper, a minor one. But the bottom line is that when we offer people a questionnaire and we simply ask them to answer some questions based on sort of a modified Caprini score, we can get a pretty good idea of who's at risk and who isn't. This is the way our, our 467 patients came back in terms of their points here, and we were able to call out of this um, a high-risk group and a very high-risk group for people that uh, we knew statistically would be at risk of DVT if they were placed in a situation where thrombosis was a possibility. So, our, our initial sc screening research has definitely shown that we can detect high-risk patients just by using a questionnaire. Do we have good prevention available? Uh, well, absolutely. We have way better ways of preventing venous disease, uh, you know, the, the serious consequences of DVT and PE, uh, than we do of preventing arterial problems. We've got all kinds, even aspirin is making a comeback now. So, yeah, there's all kinds of things we can do. And then the question becomes, does preventing venous disease really lead to better clinical outcomes? And, you know, all you have to do is look at something like the CHESS guidelines. Uh, you know, if you're not a believer in this right now, there's not a whole lot that I can, I can tell you. Prevention clearly is going to lead to better outcomes in most circumstances. 
So in, I don't think it's at all controversial about whether we should screen for venous disease. But then there's a question of what is it we're going to screen for and how are we going to do it? I've already told you that the main route by which we screen right now is through patient questionnaires and that it, it does a pretty good job and that there's nothing controversial. What about actually going out and physically scanning people and studying them? This is what I got under my, uh, you know, my windshield here. Does this add to our ability to detect and pick up stuff? Well, in the American Venus Forum data, when, when the, the control screening study was done, it turns out that we can detect uh, disease in, in a fair number of people, but what we don't know is to what extent it adds in terms of our prediction of risk, anything above what the questionnaire does, and, and certainly whether it's worth the cost. So this is very controversial. Another thing you can do is just have an expert or somebody trained inspect people. We basically ask them on these questionnaires to give us their SEEP scores, but um, what happens when you have somebody from the community, or uh, physicians actually go in there and look? It turns out that we can put everybody in a SEEP classification, and many people will have things like varicose veins, telangiectasias, edema, but again, you know, does this kind of information here, the idea that 32% of patients have varicose veins or that, you know, 11% have edema, does this quantified information help us predict risk better? It's controversial. And then there's this whole issue of should we screen for heritable factors um, and under what circumstances? You know, the, um, the British Society of Hematology has recently come out with uh, a whole series of recommendations and, and they've you know, given a big list of times when they think that screening for heritable thrombophilia is or isn't appropriate. Dr. Hunter would certainly have issues with their recommendations. And, and again, this is why I say this is just from a practical standpoint a very controversial point that, uh, that we don't have great answers for right now. Then finally the question becomes, who do we screen? Conventional wisdom says that we ought to screen, you know, based on the probability that a person has the risk. So you don't screen kids, right, because their risk would be low. And you definitely wouldn't screen these guys because they've got the disease, you're, you're sure. Maybe the soft, you know, middle ground is guys like this. This is who you need to screen. But who we ought to be screening is again very controversial. <laughs> so should, with venous disease, should we be screening everybody? Well, you know, most screening programs try to identify sort of high-risk groups. They try to identify, you know, guys like this where they can find their aneurysm and get it fixed. Is just screening high-risk groups the way to do it? Or should we be screening everybody? Because in the case of venous screening, what we're really doing is screening is an opportunity to increase awareness about disease and to educate people about the risks of DVT. So you could wind up like this happy guy here who knows how to, uh, knows what his risk is and uh, has an idea about what he's going to do. Probably in the case of venous disease, unlike arterial disease, everybody is a candidate for screening, but as long as we limit it to the, uh, to the questionnaire format. And that, in fact, is what's going on. You know, the Legs for Life program out there, Patty, you know, that SIR runs, has 24 questions devoted to venous disease that you can use to screen for venous disease. They don't advocate specific scanning or other, uh, other things. They, they like the questionnaire approach. Lifeline screening, which is a, a screening program that's based on scanning more than anything else, doesn't do venous testing. So again, there's controversy there. Um, so I'll just finish up here by saying that although the public may be aware of venous disease, as we've heard this morning, they're generally not really privy to the potential devastating risks of this thing and the potential morbidity. So in the case of venous disease, it's not about finding and fixing occult problems. It's really going to be more about awareness, education, and doing the things that you've got to do to prevent the problems from occurring. And I just sort of end on this picture, which 
although I live in Minnesota, this was taken. This is not photoshopped. It was taken in Naperville. Um, I came across this scene on a, on a road there, but, you know, again, if we could have educated this guy about this, we might have uh, solved the dilemma. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It's always educational and very entertaining. You're a hard act to follow, I think. Dr. Golan's probably thinking that right now as he comes. Dr. Golan is a vascular surgeon who lives here in Chicago. He works at North Shore, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about combination venous disease, deep and superficial. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Thanks. Which are my... Uh... Um, this is the laser, and this is forward. Okay. So my name is John Golden, and I'm a vascular surgeon. About two-thirds of my practice is venous, and about one-third is arterial. And Patty is right, uh, following Dr. Rook is always sort of a tough act. My slides aren't nearly as fancy, but I hope they're as effective. So the topic I've been asked to address is, a is what do you do when you have a patient with varicose veins, basically, or superficial venous reflux, but you also find deep reflux at the same time? So to talk about those two situations, when you have primary venous insufficiency, it's generally thought to be degenerative. Reflux is a primary problem. There's no obstruction. Uh, the manifestation is varicose veins, and it's very widespread. Treatment is either going to be support or superficial surgery. The majority of patients with uh, secondary venous insufficiency are going to be an acquired problem from a DVT, where obstruction and reflux are the problem. Uh, the intimus have been destroyed, the valves have been destroyed. Uh, fortunately, it's limited in occurrence, and the treatments are primarily anticoagulation and support. And then in between, there's going to be the patient that has a combination of superficial reflux and deep venous reflux based just on primary valvular insufficiency. And that's really who we're going to be talking about. You know that the majority of patients with deep venous reflux at treatments are traditionally compression or medical grade compression therapy. And for many in the world, that's really thought the only thing that you can do. Uh, there are patients, and we're gonna find those, who have superficial and deep venous reflux, where the deep venous reflux will be cured by ablating the superficial venous system. And for the non-surgeons out here, when you have a patient who has truly bad deep venous reflux, there are surgical techniques, not done frequently, that involve either trans valve transposition or valve replacement, uh, that can be effective for some of these patients. So there are actually some surgical techniques not frequently used to address these issues. So what's the magnitude of the problem? If you look at patients with superficial venous reflux and Doppler ultrasound and you examine the deep venous system, about 22% of patients are going to have combined deep and superficial venous reflux. I was always taught that if you have deep and superficial venous reflux, there's nothing you can do about the superficial venous reflux because it's just going to recur, and you should condemn that patient to a life of compression therapy. I hope to show you that that's not correct. So that leads to the question of can we predict when we'll eliminate deep venous reflux with superficial vein ablation? And secondly, does it really matter? So here are a few studies that looked at this issue. Uh, the first two were before the endovascular era, and these patients were treated with vein strippings. And the second were treated, or the third patient, the third group was treated with vein ablation. And you can see in the first two studies by Walsh and Sales, when they had patients with combined deep and superficial venous reflux, they eliminated the deep venous reflux by eliminating the uh, superficial reflux. On the other hand, the last study, they only eliminated it 32% of the time, and we're going to try to show you why. Uh, this slide is, unfortunately, I do need to be able to point, but I guess I'll be able to to some extent here. Uh, so this just shows a deep venous system. And what you have to remember when you're doing your venous ultrasound is that when blood is refluxing down this great saphenous vein, that blood has to come from somewhere. Now, in about 75 or 80 percent of that patients, that blood is actually coming up the femoral vein and then refluxing down the great saphenous vein. In the other 20 to 25 percent of patients, blood actually refluxes down the external iliac and common femoral vein into the saphenous vein. And when you eliminate that venous tributary or that venous runoff bed by ablating the great saphenous vein, the reflux above goes away and normalizes. The same thing in the popliteal vein. 
when you have reflux in the popliteal vein above the small saphenous vein that has reflux, you eliminate the small saphenous reflux through ablation and the popliteal vein reflux goes away. The patients who don't do quite as well are the patients who have reflux up and down the entire deep venous system. And this just shows a study from 2003 where they looked at patients with saphenous vein reflux who had uh, deep venous reflux. And you'll see, if you do the math quickly, that 56% of the patients had reflux confined to the common femoral vein above the saphenous vein or to the popliteal vein above the saphenous vein. And roughly uh, 20 patients, or I guess 21, 19 patients, had diffuse reflux throughout both systems. Now, one thing you have to know a little bit about to interpret the next studies, and you should know about if you're actually uh, treating patients with venous disease, are something like the venous refilling time. This is pretty much done with a photoplasmisograph these days, or a, or a venous PPG. But if you have someone actually pump their leg five to 10 times, you'll see that the color in the leg or the venous pressure drops in the leg. And then generally it takes greater than 23 seconds for that color or for that pressure to return to normal. And that's a time it takes the arterial system to kind of recolor or repressurize the leg. When you have venous insufficiency, that long line that you see coming down here actually becomes just a hump like a camel's hump, and the venous refilling time might be four, five, six seconds. And that's what we want to know if we can correct. The other thing you need to know about is the venous clinical severity score, which I believe the Venus Forum came up with several years ago to try to grade or quantify the degree of venous insufficiency patients have. So they look at 10 factors, and you can go through the list there, the presence of pain, varicose veins, induration, ulcers, a number of ulcers, and they grade them on a scale of zero to three. So I have a venous clinical severity score of zero, maybe a little bit of pain after standing up here all day. Uh, but the typical patient with varicose vein disease is gonna have a score anywhere from six to 10, Patients with severe deep venous insufficiency might have a score of 15, 16, or 20. And whenever you provide any sort of intervention for that patient, then you're going to reevaluate that patient and see whether or not you improve their venous clinical severity score. And so the couple studies we're going to look at are going to look at this. So here's a study that looked at patients with combined deep and superficial venous reflux and what happened to them after they had their great saphenous vein ablated. And you can see that both their venous filling index and their venous clinical severity score improved significantly even in the presence of deep venous insufficiency. This looks at the long-term success of vein ablation in patients with deep venous insufficiency. And you can also see that the veins stay closed over, the, over uh, up to 30 months regardless of the presence or absence of venous insufficiency in the deep system prior to their vein ablation. And again, this looks out over a long period of time uh, looking at the, um, at the changes in the venous clinical severity score, and you can see they persist over time by ablating the great saphenous or the small saphenous vein. And then, so basically their uh, conclusion was that the venous clinical severity score improved regardless of the presence or absence of deep venous insufficiency. And so that's a good thing to know when you're seeing these patients. In fact, there are lots of things you can help patients with when they have combined deep and supervenous venous insufficiency. Um, and this is, again, just another study that showed the same thing uh, following vein ablation. Uh, now, the, the question becomes then, and, and here's an example of a patient who had combined reflux in, his deep system, in her deep system in the common femoral vein and in the uh, great saphenous vein. Now, she'd been told, been told by several physicians that she'd seen prior to myself that, in fact, there was nothing they could do for her because she had this deep venous insufficiency. She was going to be prone to failure uh, with treatment. So she actually was in Una boots and compression stockings for 10 years before she saw me. And we ablated her great saphenous vein, which had severe reflux um, uh, coming right down to this point here. So we ablated her saphenous vein from here all the way up to the saphenofemoral junction. And then you can see her leg eight weeks later uh, when basically all her venous stasis ulcers are healed, her redness is gone, her pain is gone, and this was really the first time in 10 years uh, that she had had a healed leg, and to this day now, eight years later, her leg has remained healed without the need for compression therapy. Typically, as I say, compression therapy is, the, is essential to minimize the progression of venous stasis changes. 
However, when you do have someone with deep venous insufficiency secondary to obstruction, what happens in many of those patients is the perforators down in the ankle and calf become a pressure relief valve for these patients. So even though they have obstruction, they're trying to relieve the obstruction by forcing that pressure to the perforators, and you wind up with venous stasis changes. And again, the typical therapy would involve some type of compression, either with an unaboot or a stocking, uh, and some type of dressing product here. Uh, you can use duoderm, polymem. There's literally 150 different wound products you can put on these patients. But if you actually look carefully at these patients, you'll find that many of them you can actually treat with either sclerotherapy or endovenous ablation. And here's just an example of a woman who's had a DVT. She has a large perforator actually coming out of, uh, coming out of her ankle right here, leading to this area of venous eczema. She was 86 years old. She was quite miserable. When we studied her, she had some obstruction of her deep venous system. She had deep venous reflux, no saphenous reflux, and just this perforator. So she was treated with sclerotherapy, and in fact, that was her leg eight weeks later, just by eliminating her perforator uh, and eliminating those varicose veins. Now, this result may not last forever, but if it recurs, it's again very simple uh, to treat her. So one of the things I've found over the last eight years is there is rarely a patient with venous stasis ulceration and changes for which there isn't some interventional procedure that you can do to assist and maintain healing of their wound. So the days of having to put someone in an una boot for weeks or months or even years to heal an ulcer, I think are really behind us. So kind of in conclusion, uh, deep venous insufficiency is not a contraindication to saffron's vein ablation. Uh, deep venous reflux will be eliminated or improved in the majority of patients. Those patients who have diffuse reflux throughout their entire deep venous system and saphenous vein are not going to do as well, and they'll have a higher incidence or recurrence of their chronic venous insufficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Golan. And uh, Dr. Rook is going to give us uh, an overview now uh, of lymphedema, which uh, we've uh, touched on all morning long here. And I want to remind everybody that there's a luncheon, there's a luncheon and an arter uh, venous and an arterial luncheon that uh, you're welcome to stay for. I think they'll be providing lunch uh, during the talk. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Well, we'll give this one more try here. The truth about lymphedema uh, with a little bit of emphasis in this case, I thought lymphedema was too big of a subject to cover in 15 minutes, so I'm going to emphasize some on the manual lymphatic drainage because I think that that's sort of a curious and controversial place to go. And I have no disclosures except that understand I have no bias either for or against manual lymphatic drainage. Well, this is what we've spent part of the day discussing, and you've already seen some of this stuff. Lymphedema, where is it? What's it come from? We, we, got the, we got big reds and we got big blues, and every day a little bit of blood leaks, or a little bit of fluid leaks out of them where they come together with small vessels, and we would wind up with an awful lot of fluid, about a gallon a day in each leg accumulating, if it wasn't for these green guys here, the lymphatics that act like a storm sewer and carry this stuff back dumping it into the bloodstream at the thoracic duct. Now, a rookogram looks real simple, but in real life, these vessels are a lot more complicated with nodes and multiple passages and uh, uh, a lot of anatomic variability. Nonetheless, they can become plugged up, and when they do, they present, uh, they present with the kind of big legs that we've looked at today. Some of these can be uh, incredibly huge. This is what I... I think of as sort of the biggest legs I've ever seen in this country uh, from lymphedema. Now we've also touched on what some of the common causes of lymphedema are. What are the things that can plug up these lymph vessels? In the United States, cancer or the treatment for cancer tends to be the most common. The second most common thing is some type of trauma and that trauma can occasionally be surgical trauma with lymph node removal. Recurrent infections, recurrent cellulitis will destroy lymphatic vessels. And as we've heard, filarial disease can do it. And, and uh, we saw a leg like this earlier. We heard that it was a tropical form of lymphedema, that it was caused by filaria. 
But this can't be very common, can it, Patty? I mean, how many legs like this could exist in the world? A thousand? Twenty thousand? Fifty thousand? Well, the World Health Organization tells us that there are over 100 million people with filarial-related clinically apparent lymphedema. It's after malaria, it's the next most common pathological condition in the world. So this is very common. Well, how are you going to treat this stuff? That's what I thought I'd talk about today. You know, one way to treat lymphedema is just to let gravity do the work. You could prop the legs up and let it, fill, uh, let it trickle back. We use elastic compression, of course. That's a good way to do it. And that's led to a variety of programs that incorporate various wraps and, uh, and compressive uh, modalities. We have all kinds of pumps out there that can be used to treat uh, lymphedema. Some of these generate more than 100 millimeters of mercury pressure in the process of squeezing. There are people who worry about that, that that might be too much mercury, that it might be like parking a mercury car on somebody. And again, <laughs> we get lots of laughter and lots of jokes out of the idea of over-aggressive compression and over-aggressive pumping as being bad for us. This is sort of something we have ingrained in our national psyche. So another way to try to approach lymphedema and to get it out of there is to consider massaging it out of there. But again, conventional massage, like conventional pumping, tends to be a fairly vigorous activity. Uh, we think of uh, you know, pro wrestlers, we think of people being attacked by giant constricting snakes or maybe having an elephant step on them. And just as there are those who advocate strongly that we shouldn't be uh, using pumps, there are those who advocate strongly that we shouldn't be letting elephants step on people either. So this, is, uh, this has led to um, some standoffs, or at least it did until the 1930s when this couple came along. These are the Vaters, uh, Swiss, German, Austrian. They, they came from a lot of backgrounds and moved around a lot. But the important thing is, is that in the 1930s, they began to develop a new technique for massaging that lymphatic fluid out of limbs. And unlike other massage methods, this incorporated a very light approach. Now, why, why would that work? Why would a light massage work? Well, this is what a blow-up of what a lymphatic vessel looks like. It's, it's got a lot of smooth muscle and a lot of closely placed valves, and these... Um, these little units that are formed between the valves are called lymphangions. And you can either actively compress these by having the lymphatic vessels squeezed on by the surrounding muscles, or you can, and we call that a passive lymph pump, so when you walk or you, you, get, you get massage, you can squeeze it out that way like you're squeezing toothpaste along a tube or we have an active lymph, lymph pump. If you can just stimulate the smooth muscle in those vessels to constrict on, or on its own, you'll get little peristaltic waves that'll pump this. And that's what this light compression is supposed to do. This light stimulation, this light massage, stimulates the lymphangions and, and gets these peristaltic actions going to move the fluid. Now, if you take something like meticulous skin hygiene, and you couple it with manual lymphatic drainage, and you consider adding in body wraps, and if anybody wants, I've got a coupon for a lymphatic body wrap here, and you exercise, a lot of this exercise is done with compression, and you wear your compression, you, you create a program that we often refer to as complex decongestive physiotherapy, and this has really become uh, along with pumping, the big uh, way that we treat lymphedema in this country. So I'm going to ask you this question. Does manual lymphatic drainage work? A lot of people look at this as voodoo. Ooh, I'm going to just rub the arm lightly, and this is going to stimulate stuff. Does it work? <laughs> well, duh. I mean, uh, you know, of course it works in a, in a big sense. I reviewed over 100 papers in anticipation of this meeting, and about two-thirds of them fall into this category. They're simple papers that look at limb size, for example, before and after you massage them, and they all show the same things. These small series uh, basically all show that lymphatic, manual lymphatic drainage adds a positive effect. So, 
you know, if you read most of the papers that get published in the literature, it looks like it works. But what if we just limit ourselves to some of the better studies, like randomized clinical trials? Well, you know, here's a particular randomized clinical trial published in the oncology literature back in 2000, looked at a small number of patients, but randomized them, and came away with the idea that MLD uh, doesn't significantly contribute to edema reduction, comes up with a, a different view. Well, to make it even more controversial here, we can do meta-analyses on all the randomized trials that are out there. And when we do that, we can look, for example, at uh, the 10 randomized trials that have been done. And if we look at this entity of combined physical therapy and we apply the same rules of analysis to all those different parts, we come up with the idea that wrapping and bandaging is effective and that intermittent pneumatic compression works and that all those other ancillary things like skin care and exercise and compression sleeve and arm elevation, they all seem to help. But specifically, does MLD work? Hard to get a consensus on this. Well, probably the gold standard for coming up with uh, decisions when it's available is a Cochrane review. And Cochrane has actually looked at, uh, at this topic. They're the, yeah, they're the gold standard. And came away with the conclusion, after reviewing the literature they're interested in, that MLD doesn't provide any extra benefit over other forms of therapy, which sort of seemed like heresy to the, uh, um, you know, the advocates of massage. But I will point out, that using their criteria, they only found one crossover study that they felt was suitable for analysis. So it's a very limited amount of work. Why is it so hard? Why are we having so much trouble figuring out if manual lymphatic drainage, the fastest growing way of treating lymphedema in the United States, works or not? Well, I would argue that there are four factors that play into controversies or uncertainties or dilemmas in this area. We don't know, and they, they ask, center around these questions. Is there a correct technique? Why and how does it work? How do we select our patients? And what exact indications do we use this for? Well, with regard to the issue of correct technique, it's kind of fun, because if you get, uh, say, four different um, MLD specialists, massage therapists in a room, you're gonna get five different opinions about how it ought to be done. And this makes, for example, the insurance companies crazy. I just leapt on, line and pulled down Aetna's policy, and Aetna will cover for manual lymphatic drainage in the appropriate circumstances. And they describe you know, what it is that they think they're paying for, but they're very quick to point out that although we'll cover this world, we want you to understand nobody's really given us a specific description of what it is we're paying for. And indeed, you can go into the literature, and whether you look in the physical therapy world, the, the um, the osteopathic world, the, um, the lymphedema treatment specialist world, you'll come up with all these different techniques for how we can do this. Osteopaths, for example, have for years used um, specific techniques involving thoracic and abdominal wall pumps. So this is, a, um, this is an area that makes insurance companies crazy. And to make it even tougher, we now have pumps with multiple chambers that can be programmed to inflate sequentially in a way that simulates massage. So does this constitute massage or not? Well, second question, how does this work? Why does it work? Why, you know, there's no, not only no specific technique that's really accepted, but there's no great theory about why light stimulation works. We all understand how hard stimulation will help uh, squeeze lymphatic fluid through vessels much like you squeeze toothpaste out. But when you think about the light stimulation of manual lymphatic drainage, if you want to decompress a leg, you start up here and stimulate the vessels and then move to here and then move down and eventually work your way toward the leg, emptying. It's not clear why these lymphatics that we're stimulating aren't working at full speed already. Why do they even need additional stimulation? So there's some theoretical concerns we still haven't answered. And then there's a whole issue of patient selection. Insurance companies will typically cover MLD if your patient has ulceration, 
usually not a product of lymphedema, is it? You, all, lymphedema usually doesn't ulcerate. Or if they have intractable lymphedema that's failed some tests, or if they have complications. Uh, but they don't answer simple questions like, should it be used in primary versus secondary lymphedema? Or does the severity, the actual severity, play a role? Should MLD be used in mild lymphedema as opposed to severe, or vice versa? And then there's finally this use of, or this issue of questionable indications. And I've blotted, this just is from a website I, I dug up there. I've blotted them off to protect the innocent. Here's what this center, the Something Therapeutic Center, is recommending we use manual lymphatic drainage for, reducing edemas and lymphedemas of various origins. Sounds great, doesn't it, Patty? That's what we ought to use it for. Except they also will treat you for a few other conditions. Uh, including uh, reducing memory problems, the anti-aging effect, uh, fat removal, stimulating the immune system, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, there's a community out there that is using manual lymphatic drainage in ways that are clearly inappropriate and kind of ruining it for the rest of the community. So what am I going to come up here and tell you with my 13 minutes that I devoted to this? I'm going to tell you that MLD is probably effective as an adjunct therapy for lymphedema, but we got a lot of areas that we still need to clarify. We don't know if it's better than other things like wrapping alone or pumps or elevation. We don't really understand yet exactly how or why manual lymphatic drainage works. We don't understand what the best massage techniques are, and we don't really know if there's a role for patient selection and if certain patients can be benefited more by one technique than another. And sort of with that, uh, oh, and then we've also got this question of proper indication. So we need further study on all of these if we expect to be able to answer it. Thank you very much. I have a question for Dr. Roque, and if anyone else does, I think we have time for one question here. Um, you know, it's paradoxical, but I think that lymph patients with swelling and lymphedema often uh, don't realize that they're, under, they're not hydrated well enough. And if you hydrate people, their lymphatics work better. And so they think they're not supposed to have a lot of hydration because they're swollen already, but if you hydrate them well, their lymphedema gets less. Now, is that, is that your own personal clinical observation? It's or? worked on a number of patients yeah. that I've treated, and I, and I say you need to be hydrated and you need to move. This is idiopathic, not traumatic, not post-surgical edema. Because you know that's just crazy enough to be true, what you're telling. <laughs> well, you know, and the lymphedemas are classically these high-protein edemas. They're, they're often, you know, trying to move viscous fluids through the few remaining lymphatic vessels that a person has uh, still, still working. And I can envision scenarios in which, um, in which actually hydrating uh, may, may be very important for stimulating lymphatic flow and may actually reduce, for example, viscosity mm -hmm. and, and lead to more protein removal from the mm -hmm. tissue than you would get, uh, than you would get otherwise. So. I've actually seen good clinical results with putting people on a certain kind of, you know, lots more a lot more water than they were drinking. Yeah. You know, we see the, to, to put it in terms that even I can understand, we see the same thing in reverse all the time. It always amazes me that when I drink beer, I get dehydrated, you know, because you get, <laughs> you get more diuresis than you're putting in. There are these paradoxical situations where actually by adding more fluid, in, in the case of a low osmotic solution, you could, uh, it makes perfect sense that you may be able to and, stimulate. And the water actually, uh, some of it comes from reading uh, the Penta water uh, information, which is a, a smooth water that's supposed to be very hydrating compared to waters that have minerals in them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, knowledge that we don't have yet. I'm not familiar with the Penta water world, but. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's an expensive water, but it goes through a high process of removing all of the uh, minerals, so it's low osmotic, hmm. so they think it hydrates your body well. Well, uh, so there's off, that's controversial, <laughs> for sure. Um, 
Dr. Jaffer wanted me to tell you that the lunch is right outside to go. Please have some lunch, take a little break, and come back in here for a noon symposium, which is provided by Covidian, and we're going to be discussing uh, RF ablation. Please, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here this morning.
<laughs> I changed it a little bit. Okay, it's not like I use it, but the whole idea is like it's like something that's kind of fun to train the food to do that. So, so I changed some of the words to okay, okay. incorporate it to show it. And she loves it. She totally loves it. So, like, every time. <laughs> yeah. She's young now. You so wait. She, uh, She'll be scarred for life. Yeah, <laughs> But she brings, she brings, she brings me the guitar. Okay, so it's not like I'm a blue guitarist because I'm not. But she thinks I'm awesome. Why she thinks I'm awesome? That's all that matters. I just need to have her think I'm awesome between the ages of 14 and 20. Yeah. 24. 24. Is that what it is? for it now. 